the topic that we are looking at is one that is, I think, exciting. It is full of a mistake. Promise. It has already achieved so much. So what are we talking about? We're talking about how we can have an energy efficient infrastructure that provides for much greater resiliency in our local economies, in our local communities, and that we can do this through looking at district energy, what it is doing in communities and uh, at military bases, hospitals, universities, etc. CHP, CHP combined power and microgrids. And we're going to see this morning how all of these technologies play a role, come together in terms of the confluence of them, it really provides enormous opportunities for gains in efficiency, environment, and sound business sense. And so I'm very, very excited that we've been working with the International District Energy Association with regard to uh, bringing this briefing together as well as with Senator Franken's office. I do want to mention that we are anticipating that Senator Franken is going to come by about 10 o'clock juggling three to four hearings this morning. So when he comes, we will simply yield the podium to him and then we'll resume when he has to leave. Um, so, uh, but we feel very, very pleased that he is taking such a huge interest and leadership role in this whole topic. And during our session this morning, we are also going to be hearing about the overall outlook, what's involved in these technologies. We're going to be seeing uh, and hearing about case studies, looking at different aspects, and also looking at what what's the implication for policy, what's going on um, in terms of thinking about both policy needs, and what are we learning from the state level that perhaps could be replicated and, and utilized at the national level. Uh, where, where should we be going so that we truly can reap the promise of what we have already seen as great and growing success. So to start us off this morning, I want to turn first to Rob Thornton, who is the President and CEO of IDEA, the International District Energy Association. Rob. Thanks very much, Carol, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, those of you uh, from congressional staff, thank you for coming over. Those of you who sort of uh, suffered the gauntlet of security, I think exacerbated by sequestration, uh, thank you for making the making it here with us today. So this is a typical power plant. If I could, you know, this is the average day in a typical remote power plant in the U.S. where two-thirds of the fuel is exhausted as heat. Um, essentially, it hasn't changed a whole lot since Eisenhower was in the White House. Now, the DOE has recognized this, and in the quadrennial review, they've called it out that, you know, the average efficiency of a coal-fired central station power plant still is around 32 percent. And if you look at the coal-fired fleet in the U.S., it averages between 26 and a half and 39 percent. You know, it's still only about a third of the energy that goes into the plant comes out as useful electricity. And we think we can do better. Let me just share you a case study. This is a power plant near where I grew up in Somerset, uh, Massachusetts. It's the largest fossil-fired plant in New England, Brayton Point. It's about 1,600 megawatts. It's been operating uh, since I was in kindergarten, 1964. Uh, like most remote central generating stations, it takes the water from the Taunton River and exhausts the heat into the Mount Hope Bay. And it's been doing that since 1964, nearly 60 years of rejected heat. And it's a lot of heat. Every year, about 37 trillion BTUs are exhausted into the bay. Now, this is really not the right solution and in fact it was a cause for the plant having to comply with an EPA uh, water management uh, you know, uh, requirement or thermal pollution requirement. Ultimately they've made some changes but every year it's about 400 million dollars worth of heat they're throwing away into the bay. So recently, the owners of this plant actually, you know, decided to comply, and they invested about $570 million in cooling towers. And so now this plant has these spiffy new cooling towers that really dominate the skyline in Fall River. Uh, and if you live near this plant, you might have a different view of the impact of this scale. 
So essentially what they've done is instead of wasting the heat into the bay, they're wasting it into the sky. So continually today, $400 million worth of heat is now still being essentially exhausted. Now the bad news for this plant is even though the owners have invested over a billion dollars in compliance, both with it's a coal-fired and natural gas plant, even though they, you know, they've done their stewardship, they've invested in compliance, the plant capacity factor is now well below economic. And it's now for sale. And recently the owner announced they're taking a $780 million write-down on this plant and another. We think there's a better solution. Instead of just exhausting the heat, you can put it in a pipe and sell the heat to heat buildings and communities nearby. Now this is not a new idea. We've been doing it for over 100 years. And in Europe, they're doing it in a profound way. We call it district heating. In Copenhagen, they caught on to this. And they built a network, a thermal transmission network, of all of their power plants, and they put it into a, a wholesale network, and it supplies heat to 18 communities. And their investment in this pipe in Greater Copenhagen is about as much as that utility invested in those towers. So now, Copenhagen, or Denmark, has this useful form of heat that's displacing emissions. It allows them to sell more gas instead of burning it. It's changed their energy trade balance from a deficit of minus $5 billion a year to a trade surplus of $6 billion a year. Now, district energy alone does not account for this, but it's the under, underpinning, it's the foundational structure in Denmark that has enabled their energy and environmental success. So their power plants, and this plant in Copenhagen operates at efficiency of not 37 or 32, but over 90 percent because they sell the heat. This plant is now being converted to be 100 percent renewable. It started with coal, but now it'll all be biomass. And the owners of this plant actually have a very valuable asset, which will have a different future than a plant that only produces, only yields a third of its output. Very simple graph, but really what we're talking about now is recovering heat and making it useful, improving the energy efficiency of our electric and our fundamental in infrastructure. So district energy combined heat and power, we think, is a foundational advantage for this country. Simply put, it's a central plan, and in the U.S. we have literally hundreds of these systems at a different scale. Uh, this, the Capitol Power Plant, which provides the heating and cooling to all the buildings on Capitol Hill, is a district energy system. This whole campus on the top of the hill is connected to district energy. And so we have smaller scale plants that mo make you know, heating and cooling in the form of steam or chilled water or hot water, and that's distributed to buildings and they use it for heating and air conditioning. But what's now coming is really mayors want a district energy microgrid. They want to make power as well as heat and cooling. And we're seeing now an interest in local generation, smaller scale, with the uh, sequence of extreme weather and grid issues, resiliency and reliability are becoming more of a driver. And that is our strong suit. So when you have smaller generation units populated uh, closer to the load centers, you actually have higher reliability. And when you have a district energy network and it's connecting tens or hundreds of buildings, now you've created a thermal scale. By providing the heating and cooling to multiple buildings, it creates an economy of scale where you can invest in technologies that really don't pencil on a building-by-building -building basis, like biomass or wood waste. Geothermal has you know, more profound opportunities with a district energy network. But we're, because we're underground, we're hidden from view. And frankly, district energy doesn't really get the headlines or the visibility uh, that we deserve. But there are literally hundreds of systems in the U.S. And what this infrastructure now allows is the flexibility of multiple fuels over time. You can deploy local energy supplies, uh, biomass, or even cold water from the nearby lake to air condition your city or campus. And so we really future-proof cities by having this thermal network and when you have a thermal use, 
it makes combined heat and power or cogeneration that much more productive. By aggregating and harnessing the heating needs of dozens of buildings, we really enable cogeneration to, to work uh, perfectly. All across the U.S., if, if any of you went to a you know, college in this, in this you know, country, I'd be willing to bet that you lived in a dorm that was supplied by district heating. Uh, ubiquitous in our college campuses, and you're going to hear from one of my colleagues from Princeton University shortly. In fact, working with the Department of Energy, we've identified nearly 300 district heating systems that today have tremendous opportunity to plug in cogeneration. They've already got the heating network in place. They can add cogeneration, really, you know, dramatically improve their efficiency, and this could represent 11 gigawatts of the 40 gigawatt goal that the administration set forth in, uh, in August of last year. You'll hear more about that. But the district energy industry is actually low-hanging fruit for application of combined heat and power. Top of the chart now is resiliency. Mayors want more sustainable resources. And local infrastructure in the event of climate adaptation and events. I'm going to close with this event, Superstorm Sandy. Seems like, well, it was six months ago. The biggest storm in history, a convergence of a number of factors. Total estimated economic cost over $71 billion. 21 states were affected by the storm, as far west as Michigan. 57,000 utility workers had to restore power. It was an inundation of really dramatic proportions. Parts of the Northeast were literally underwater and under siege. But one system in particular in the Bronx, Co-op City, stayed online. They have a 40 megawatt combined heat and power plant. There's 60,000 residents. They provide power, steam, and cooling. I'm sorry, sir. You're going to have to yield the microphone. All right. So uh, I, it's my pleasure to introduce our, our colleague and friend, uh, Senator Al Franken from Minnesota. It's, uh, he's been a really strong proponent of district energy. And let's give Senator Al Franken a nice round of applause. Senator? Very impressive, smooth transition. <laughs> I want to thank the Environmental and Energy Study Institute for holding this, uh, this briefing. I'm glad that you're focusing on how we can increase uh, energy efficiency and make our local energy supplies more, more reliable. Combined heat and power systems have a lot of potential in our economy by capturing heat that would otherwise be wasted. It can be put to use heating homes and, and buildings, other buildings, generating electricity, and put to use in the manufacturing process. For example, heat generated by electricity production can be captured and used to heat buildings instead of going to waste in St. Paul, Minnesota, for example. A biomass-fueled combined heat and power system generates electricity and the waste heat from the facility provides heat to about 80% of the commercial, residential, and industrial buildings in downtown St. Paul. But despite all of the benefits of combined heat and power, it is underutilized in our economy. The President has a goal of adding 40 gigawatts of new CHP to the current 80 gigawatts by 2020. I applaud President Obama for supporting CHP, but I think we can go further. I think we can double our CHP capacity by 2020. That's why I will soon introduce legislation to incentivize the deployment of these energy saving systems. CHP systems have high upfront costs, but they pay for themselves through energy savings over time. That's why my legislation will include financing mechanisms so that manufacturers and municipalities can access funds to get, uh, to get past these upfront costs. My legislation will also enable communities, businesses, and others to get technical assistance from the Department of Energy on setting up CHP systems so that more consumers can take advantage of these energy savings. I would encourage all of you to reach out to your senators and ask them to support my legislation. I'm Al Franken. I, um, 
I want to thank Mark Spur uh, for working with my office and for his work with the city of Grand Marais in uh, northern Minnesota on a district heating project. I also want to thank Ken Smith for his work and the other panelists for coming here to talk about this important issue. Thank you all. Thanks very much, Senator. Thanks. Thank you very much, Senator Franken. In fact, uh, in St. Paul, in Minneapolis, we have prime examples of how district energy can provide economic environmental benefits, and, and he's seen it firsthand, and so we really applaud his support. And we're going to reach out to all of you as his bill is announced. We would hope that you would help us in uh, uh, garnering additional sponsorship support and moving this legislation. It will be uh, fundamental in advancing, I think, in deploying much more of the system we're talking about. I'm going to conclude uh, with, let me just finish my wrap up here. Um, moving from Minnesota back to the home of the New York Yankees. So this system stayed on when the rest of the region was dark. If this co-op city, if this were a city, it would be the 11th largest city in the United States, in, in New York, I'm sorry, 60,000 residents. Because they had combined heat and power on campus, they weathered the storm. And you see this in mission critical operations where you would expect energy reliability is paramount. Like uh, uh, you know, cities and towns, Nassau Energy and Long Island stayed on. The uh, district heating cooling system in Atlantic City where you know, they supply energy to all the casinos stayed on. I don't know if they had many players, but uh, the hospital in Danbury, South Oaks Hospital, Hartford Hospital, and this is a little known the Bergen County Wastewater Treatment Plant had CHP and stayed on. And we often overlook the impact of when those pumps stop running and the sewage gets released into you know, the local environment, it is not only costly, it's very dangerous. And so having combined heat and power at a wastewater treatment plant was a very thoughtful and cost-effective solution. And when we think about energy durability, we need to look at our infrastructure needs more closely. Uh, our next panelist, Ted Borer from Princeton University, they got hit head on. New Jersey was right in the in, uh, you know, dead center. And most of the universities that had CHP actually provided area of refuge for their uh, uh, students. College of New Jersey, Fairfield University, Stony Brook, even NYU in Manhattan stayed online, except for a slight bump uh, throughout the storm. And Princeton University, because they have a very robust district energy combined heat and power facility, really were, was a shining beacon of what we can deliver in terms of resiliency. And so it's now my pleasure to yield the panel, the, the podium to Ted Borer from Princeton University, and, uh, and he's going to tell you a little bit about uh, their experience there. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Rob. And I'm also so glad that you raised the whole issue of wastewater treatment facilities because, as we know, this is such a piece of critical infrastructure that as we think about the growing incidence of extreme weather events and the vulnerabilities that are created um, with very, very um, profound implications in terms of, of public health uh, if, if those pumps go down. Uh, it really does need to play a role in terms of how we think about planning for our future. So as, as Rob said, it's so interesting to think about the lessons learned and in terms of what we saw with that dreadful Superstorm Sandy. And so we are very, very glad to have one of those folks here who really went through this and can talk firsthand about his experience, Ted Bohr, who is with Princeton University and is the energy plant manager there. Ted. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, talking with a couple of the staff and uh, writer who are here this morning before we started, a couple people said, well, um, Give us the buzzword. You know what's the what's the uh, uh, what's the what's the takeaway? Really simply, ask the question: Where's the waste, and how can I take advantage of that? And I think you'll find that cogeneration, CHP, district energy really answers that. So, with I, I'm going to give Princeton University as an example. This is where I work, but you can think of this as a town of 12,000 people. You can think of this as a small community and 
as Rob said, and as, as uh, honestly, I think you should hire Senator Franken because he does a better job than any of us explaining this stuff. But, but as he said, um, this can scale up nationally. This can scale up to entire large cities. And it can actually scale down very small as well. So it's, it's, it's uh, quite scalable. We are a community of 12,000 people during the day. Uh, we're skewed because half our business is research. Most people know of us as education, but about half of what we do is research. So we have a little bit higher energy needs than most uh, communities of that size. For those of you who like numbers, you, you can see uh, we are a fairly energy intense organization for 12,000 people. The equipment that I've got is one gas turbine. It was actually designed for the stealth fighter. It's a, 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 a very highly responsive uh, gas turbine or jet engine. But instead of using it to move something forward, we use it to turn a generator. I've got a couple of boilers. We use the boilers to recover the heat from the gas turbine or to make steam when the gas turbine's not available. But in combination, the gas turbine and the boiler become our cogeneration plant, the combined heat and power, one energy input with two useful uh, energy outputs. The useful energy output is electricity uh, out the, gen out the uh, generator and heat, which comes out the back end of the gas turbine or the boiler, <clears throat> which we make uh, steam with to heat the campus in the winter. And in the summer, we use that steam to turn steam turbines that turn our chillers to cool the campus. So it's not only highly efficient, but it's also uh, highly utilized through the entire year. Our capacity factor is very high. We also make chilled water, just like in the Capital District. We make chilled water to cool the buildings. Uh, very cold water picks up the heat from the buildings, takes it back to the cooling tower, and rejects that uh, back to the environment. We have one form of energy storage, that is a thermal storage tank. It's about 2.6 million gallons, a little bit larger than this room, maybe 80 feet in diameter and 70 feet high. And that's enough that we can buy electricity when it's very inexpensive at night, cool off all this water, and then deliver the value from that electricity when it's very valuable. So we actually have thermal storage, and it makes the system very resilient, uh, very responsive, and much, much more uh, e uh, economically um, efficient. If you look at the plant as an energy conversion box, we buy all these forms of energy on the left-hand side, electricity, uh, natural gas and liquid fuel, push it through these energy conversion devices, and then deliver it to the campus in, in the form of steam, electricity, and chilled water. The cogeneration system, as uh, Rob suggested earlier, that top line is about one-third efficient. So if I buy one unit of fuel and put it in the gas turbine, or one unit of fuel and put it in the jet engine, and run that against the generator with nothing else, I get about one-third of a unit of energy out as useful electricity. And on an airplane, that's what happens. You lose about two-thirds of that energy that you bought. That is, the pilot takes uh, one tank of fuel. One-third of that tank of fuel pushes the airplane forward. Two-thirds of that tank of fuel on the airplane heats up the sky. It's completely wasted. In our case, we put a boiler on the back end of that uh, gas turbine, and we recover half again the energy that comes in. So now instead of a one-third efficient process, I can have between a 60 and an 80 percent efficient process. So really, we can run circles around the uh, central utility that has no thermal customer. If they could retrofit that plant that Rob was talking about and actually port that energy out to the uh, customers nearby, the buildings nearby, that plant too could be 80 percent efficient instead of rejecting all the heat up uh, to the sky or rejecting the heat to the river. We do have a district energy system on campus, central energy plant in the bottom left. The uh, network of green pipes shows our distribution system, and we serve about 180 buildings from one plant. Instead of 180 boilers, I only need three. Instead of people and tools and equipment and emissions and fuel deliveries associated with 180 buildings, I have a few people and a few tools, and they're all in one spot, and that gives me the opportunity to control the noise and the pollution and make it a much more efficient and much more cost-effective system. The, uh, uh, this is a one-day period showing the power purchase and the power generation on campus. So you're looking at 24 hours. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, I'm such a geek, I'm going to mess this up. Forget it, it's too spastic. Uh, 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 <coughs> the uh, green and the purple are the power that we're buying on two different substations. The blue and the red is the power that we're generating with our co-generation 
and our solar energy, respectively. We have five megawatts worth of uh, solar energy, so it's about a quarter of what the campus power generation uh, has. So in the middle of the night, we're making about seven megawatts with the cogen. Of course, it's dark. We're not making anything with solar. And we're buying a little bit, the green and the purple, on each of the two substations. As the price of power comes up during the day, we push the throttle forward on the cogen system. We make a lot more power, and the sun comes up, and we get a lot of solar energy. And what you see is we're backing off the purchase of power when it's expensive, but we buy a lot when it's inexpensive. So it saves us uh, huge amounts of money. And we're actually good stewards on the grid because we're demanding from the grid when it's least heavily stressed, and we're avoiding the demand on the grid when it is most heavily stressed. So it works out for us financially, but it's also a social good. I can, I can also make the argument that we are buying the least polluting power, and we're avoiding the purchase of the most polluting power. This is how it nets out over the span of a day. The green line, can you guys see that? I can't, I can't tell if that's, yeah, okay. So the green line is how much power we're buying in a 24-hour period, and the red line is the price of power. And we have, over the past maybe 20 years, through all of our different investments in CHP, district energy, cogeneration, thermal storage, we have completely inverted what is the normal pattern of power purchase. Most people buy power in the middle of the day. They buy lots when the price is very high. Most people avoid the purchase of power because they go to sleep and don't use much when uh, power, purchase, power prices are very low. We do just the opposite. We buy a whole whack of power when it's inexpensive. We store it or we use it effectively. And then through all the tools we've invested in, we avoid the purchase of power uh, when it's very expensive. This is the economic dispatch system that we've uh, built with uh, an outside company. And this is an expert guidance system. Basically, it tells the plant operators uh, based on the price of power, the price of fuel, the weather, our predictive concepts about what's going to happen. Um, it tells us how to operate the plant most efficiently. I think we'll, we'll stop on that there. But this is expert guidance. We could automate it. We choose not to. But this is really where uh, Princeton is furthest ahead, I would suggest, than uh, probably any of our peers in the way that we operate. Not the equipment that we've got, but the way that we operate what we've invested in. During Hurricane Sandy, we were the bright spot in the sky uh, through all of New Jersey. So we kept the lights on. We also were a place of refuge. Um, and our steam and our heat stayed on, our, our steam and our cooling stayed on. So none of the research was interrupted. So we could have lost millions and millions of dollars worth of research. But instead, uh, when the utility tripped, we were able to isolate the campus. We were able to run as an island. And we were able to keep everything going and not only shelter the uh, people on campus, but shelter some of the uh, first responders from the local community and, and feed them. Things that you have to do to be reliable. You need to have a base load generator behind the meter. You need the ability to run separate from the grid. So you need to be able to uh, run your generator separate from the grid. And not all generators are set up that way. Um, you need black start capability, so that is you have to be able to bootstrap yourself. You can't be dependent on the outside grid for that. And you need the ability to shed load. That is, if the campus wants more power than I can generate right now, I need a way to grossly cut off parts of the campus and uh, do a triage, essentially cut off the lesser important things and keep things like our research and the emergency facilities going. <clears throat> things that make life a whole lot better because they help pay for the system and actually make the life cycle cost much lower than um, it would be otherwise if you just had emergency backup power. Our combined cycle, or CHP, are permitting your equipment for non-emergency use, so that diesel generator that uh, provides the exit lights and it provides maybe uh, power for the elevators, that's not permitted to run all the time, so I can't save any money with that. 98% of the time, it is cold iron. It's just sitting there doing nothing for you, waiting for the emergency. My co gener plan, on the other hand, is running more than 8,000 hours a year. So that's paying itself back very quickly. Energy storage is a good idea. It makes the whole thing more resilient, more responsive. And I'd say underground utility uh, distribution is also the, one of the reasons why when the trees fall, the cars hit the poles, uh, the animal contact, we are not subject to those kind of risks. We're able to keep the lights on uh, through our central power plant uh, much more reliably. 
And rather than showing it now, I would commend you to look at this video. You've got a link to it. Um, mostly the students like to criticize the administration. Uh, it's really a fine day when the students come and interview the administration and the video says, thank you, we were really glad that you had the power plant on. We were glad that we had a place to go. We were actually glad that we weren't at home uh, during this storm. And that was a real honor. That's it. Thank you very much. That's a terrific story, Ted. Uh, and I should think that lots of universities and colleges would love to be able to replicate that and have their student bodies come back to them and, and uh, ex offer that kind of gratitude for such sound planning. We're now going to turn to Bill DeCroce, who is the CEO for Veolia Energy North America, to take another look at, at some case studies of uh, projects that they have done in uh, New England and how this is part of the whole North America system. Thanks. So, good morning. Um, Rob asked me to come and speak today and he talked about, you know, what segment I would talk about and I said, absolutely, that's easy. I have to describe a lot more difficult things on many days. So I'm here to talk about an urban application for CHP and district energy. So as you can see, my slide is labeled Green Steam, Boston and Cambridge. And I apologize to any people who might have gone to school in Cambridge. It's not in the picture. We could have gone a little wider frame to get uh, Cambridge in there, but it's a solution for both cities. And so, so why do we say Green Steam? Um, when you look at that picture of the downtown of Boston, uh, I think 14 out of those high-rises are heated from the district energy loop, and half of that energy is waste heat that otherwise would have gone into the atmosphere or into the Charles River. Okay, so 14 out of the 22 tallest buildings in downtown, half of their heating coming from energy that would have otherwise have been dumped. Now, if you ask somebody in Boston who sits in one of those high-rises how their building's heated, they say, I don't know, you know, whatever. So it's not even recognized. So we've had to literally go on this effort to educate that we've got these urban districts that are great mechanisms to deploy combined heat and power, and we're doing it today, and it's underappreciated. It's underknown. It's undermarketed. Many times we'll talk to a, a, a building owner, and they'll say, wait a minute, you mean I've got a green product coming into my building and I wasn't telling people about that? So uh, quite a bit of this, this uh, urban effort to educate people on the benefits of CHP are, are really telling a story that's been going on for an awful long time. But the point is we need to do more of it. So Veolia, um, I run Veolia Energy North America, a small part of a much bigger company. Uh, it's a French company. We operate in seven, this is a sh shameless plug obviously for Veolia, but um, we operate in 70 countries with the largest operator of district energy schemes in the world. So we operate over 800 systems around the world. It's what we do. It's the core of our energy practice. We also uh, have a water business, a large water business, and environmental services. So we're really an environmental company. That's why we look at ourselves. Violet Environment is the name of the company. So it's in the DNA of our business, frankly, to come up with these kind of solutions. So back to some ground that's already been covered. Uh, district energy, it's an aggregator. Okay, so it's a thermal aggregator. Instead of just um, having individual heating loads for a building, uh, it aggregates for an urban center. It aggregates for a campus. And as Rob said, once you have aggregated, you can deploy different technologies. So for example, different types of fuels. You can have a central plant that then distributes energy out to a campus, an urban center, whatever, and it can be fed from oil. It can be fed from gas. It can be fed from biomass, from biogas. Uh, many different sources. So uh, the benefits of aggregation and the benefits of multi-fuels also play into resiliency. So when you have a plant that is natural gas fired, it's got oil backup. If there's an interruption, uh, you can, on the, on the fuel side, you can basically swap over to another fuel. Uh, and, and as um, my uh, the colleagues of mine have previously mentioned, uh, very, very capable of withstanding um, what otherwise would be interruptions that you experience on the, on the grid, on the conventional grid. So uh, in the U.S., we're the largest portfolio of district energy plants Veolia owns, uh, 17 of these districts. And again, uh, if you just run down the East Coast, so Boston, we don't own New York, but if you talk about 
uh, the, 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 the district energy system in New York, but Boston, New York, Philly, Baltimore. Did you know that in all of those cities that the majority of that urban core is heated from a district energy system? And did you know, in fact, that over 50 percent, generally all three of the, all four of those major metropolises are heated from waste heat that have, would have otherwise been dumped? Probably didn't know that. So again, just to remind people of these district energy assets, in many cases, are there and we're underutilizing. So I'm going to get to the point of uh, a way to better utilize or more fully utilize, but not only in these urban cores, but every military base, pretty much every hospital, pretty much every college campus, uh, pretty much most industrial sites have a district energy system sitting at their core. And it's a bit perverse, but as we, as we all know that shale gas is changing the landscape of the energy uh, uh, face of America, there's um, a bit of a, and for good reason, a bit of a push towards using that as a clean alternative to other fossil fuels. We need to be mindful of the fact that we don't rush to just burn more natural gas in, in individual boilers because of their efficiency and the availability of gas. We need to make sure we shift and move that gas into combined heat and power applications. Because there will be a, there'll be a play, in many cases you have a large district energy schemes with combined heat and power, but as we push towards natural gas use, you'll see uh, buildings, institutions consider coming off the districts and burning cheap natural gas in their own facility, not in a combined heat and power application. So the more we can educate people on where these assets are, and, um, and how they're presently being utilized, the better decisions can be made. And we're finding that, you know, it's the, it's the, uh, uh, the mayors, the sustainability direct directors of, of urban uh, environments that are getting the message and they're, they're helping guide the development community, the real estate community in the right direction. But it, it takes, a lot of, uh, takes a lot of catching up with people's understanding. So keep it simple, right? I used to be an engineer, I say, and now I've been a boss for too long, so I have to have these very simple diagrams. But again, it's worth repeating. So in the center, you see, to get 85 units of useful energy, on the right, in a combined heat and power plant, you have to put in 100 units, okay? So 85% efficient. On the left-hand side, conventional, that's, and we're being generous at 50% efficiency, but that's your com uh, combined uh, cycle gas turbine facilities you have to put in 170 units. So it's, I mean, how much more simple can we get? I mean, it's kind of one of these, duh, but uh, we're not doing enough of it. Um, you, you brought up, uh, Rob brought up the example of Denmark. While the rest of the world has been trying to figure out how to slow the increase in their uh, carbon emissions, Denmark has turned it and they're coming down. Okay, and it's not due to demand destruction or bad economic environment because they're actually, their GDP has been growing throughout this period, but their profile today is back to a early 90s emissions profile. So they have turned, turned the, uh, the table, if you will, and they're actually reducing their emissions while they grow their uh, economy. Okay, so a bit of an overview of Boston uh, and Cambridge. So you can see that the, the down, ooh, hold on a second here. Oh, now I'm in trouble. There we go. Okay. So the downtown peninsula of Boston, here's Cambridge on the other side of the Charles River. So these pink shaded areas are where the districts are. So you've got a district over in Cambridge. Actually, MIT has its own district right along the river here. Harvard has another district over here. Then we have a district in Boston. And then there's another district in the Longwood Medical Area, which is Harvard Medical School, and it's all its teaching facilities. So um, we've got this big, uh, large aggregated load on the district. And how can we best utilize these technologies of district energy and combined heat and power? So today, if you can see right in the middle there, here's, again, Boston's on the right, here's Cambridge. You can see the Longfellow Bridge. There's a pipe that runs under that bridge today from this plant, this combined heat and power plant, okay, that's owned by NRG. And it uh, exports steam that otherwise would have gone into the river, okay? And on the, on the right side of the, uh, the bridge here, you've got Massachusetts uh, General Hospital, MGH, a very large medical institution. They pretty much get all their heating needs from that pipe. And then what they don't use, we buy. And we help heat Boston. So in the, in the aggregate, about half of the heating needs of the downtown area of Boston come from a pipe, from a plant. Doesn't sound all that sexy. 
but we'll get to a minute what the impact of that is. So again, the type of impact you can have with these projects is extraordinary. So uh, since we're not using all of the steam from this plant, there's still a lot going into the river, both uh, the, the predecessor to, uh, to NRG, which was uh, Genon, owned the plant, and they were having some interesting conversations with EPA along the lines of, you need to stop polluting the river with your thermal energy, just like the cooling tower case down in Brayton Point in uh, southeastern Mass. Um, they said, get out of the river. So we had a solution for them, build another pipe. So we're running down along the river across the Charles with a second pipe. Okay, again, not cheap, close to $30 million to run this pipe, large pipe. Okay, lots of waste heat recovered. And uh, in fact, what we'll do is we will then take the, situ the present situation of about half the energy heating uh, Boston come from waste heat recovery to 70%. So what does that mean? Today, if you look at, I've got an example of the, that other district, Maytep, its cogeneration facility avoids about 160,000 tons of carbon a year. The existing pipe coming across the Longfellow Bridge saves another 150,000 tons of carbon a year. The new pipe will save another 165,000 tons per year of carbon. That's huge. Now, if you slide over to the right to put it in perspective, what does that mean? It's the equivalent of how many football fields you'd have to cover with solar panels, okay? Not disparaging my brethren over in the solar community, but the point being, when you add the two pipes together, okay, the, the, the existing and the new one, it's the equivalent of 600 football fields covered with solar panels. From a not that difficult thing to do, run a pipe from a power plant to a district. Pretty straightforward stuff. Um, the last, the final thing, and I know you told me to wrap up a couple of minutes ago, so I'm going over, sorry about that, but on the resiliency note, um, you can see pictures like this repeated over and over again. A dark city with a bright spot in it. In the case in, in this year in Boston, actually in Cambridge, it's not Boston, we had a blackout. The only part of the city that was lit was Biogen IDEX campus. Why? Because there was a cogent plant in the basement. Sandy, this is the, the tale of two NYUs. You saw on the news NYU Langone Medical Center with the evacuations. What you didn't see was the other NYU campus in lower Manhattan that was lit because it had a cogen in its basement on a district. And then finally back in 2001, Maytep, which is this plant that feeds all of Harvard Medical School's teaching hospitals, okay, six hospitals with an awful lot of beds for people. Uh, we had a blackout in Boston. Again, the only island that was lit was Maytep. So it's, it's a bit of a no-brainer from, uh, from an environmental perspective, from a cost perspective, and from a resiliency perspective. We really need to make sure that we don't have a district that is naked, as I say, without a CHP attached to it. It's existing technology. It's proven. We need to do more of it. So with that, I will pass on to my uh, next colleague. Um, terrifically important stories, um, lessons, uh, and I think context in terms of the enormity of the possibilities and the extent of these solutions and where all they can be applied. And, and, and in addition, I think your point about the diversity of fuel sources is also so important because it can so depend upon where you are, what's available, um, it, it, and there are so many options that we can take advantage of. So we are now going to hear from Ken Smith, who is the CEO of Evergreen Energy, and he is going to be uh, talking a little bit about policy and some of the, the policy um, uh, ideas, recommendations that are coming out of Minnesota and what that can also mean in terms of thinking about this whole important industry and its contributions nationally. Ken? Thank you, Carol. Well, good morning. I also want to talk a little bit about why this is so important. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the evolving uh, energy system and as Ted said, focus on the waste. So we've been talking, really, if you think about our country, we've been focusing on how energy is uh, evolving really since the 70s, since we had the energy crises. Some of you in this room might remember that. Uh, some of you, the younger folks, don't. Uh, when we changed our mileage or our uh, speed limits down to 55, 
and there was a lot going on, and we started focusing on conservation in a great way. It impacted everyone. Uh, impacted some more than others. In our family, my dad bought one new car in his lifetime. It was a 1972 Ford LTD, four-door. It was gorgeous. And then we had an energy crisis, and he traded in for that yellow Pinto. Uh, we had a family of five, and so we had to fight in the back. Uh, who was going to sit in the hump in the back seat? So it impacted everybody in different ways. This is what our energy system looked like. This is from Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Um, you can research this. It's uh, on, the, on the web. And what you have on the left-hand side is the inputs, primary energy inputs. You have petroleum and coal, natural gas. And on the, in the middle here, you have what's, where it's used, electricity generation, residential, commercial, industrial, uh, transportation, and then how much is rejected or lost or wasted, okay? And then you have how much is used. Well, if you add the numbers to it, it was about 50-50. About 50% was used, about 50% was rejected. Back in 1970, before the energy crises. Um, you can see that the efficiency of power plants, about 36.7% was going, actually being used. 63% was being lost in 1970. And that made up about 30% of all the wasted energy in 1970. You can see the balance there from where it was coming from in other areas. Now, this is the flow diagram for 2010. In 1970, it was about 68 quads, 68 quadrillion BTUs of energy in, the, in our economy. Uh, today, it's about 98 quadrillion BTUs of energy, so about a 30% growth. Uh, the picture is prettier. You'll see things in there like solar and biomass. So there's been some other um, sources of energy added. Now, do you think after 40 years of energy efficiency focus, the system is more efficient today than it was in 1970? How many think it's more efficient today? How many think it's not? You're right, it's not. So here are the numbers. This is the facts. 57% um, lost today after 40 years of focusing on energy efficiency. Uh, power generation is now 32%, so we've actually decreased it uh, as far as the efficiency. Nearly 50% of the wasted energy in this country is coming from electricity generation. Nearly 57%, or nearly 50%, 47.7%. Um, you can see where we focused a lot on energy efficiency is actually in buildings and buildings went down. Uh, they were rejecting about 30% of the energy in 1970, and now they're rejecting about 15.6% of the energy. But we're focusing on pieces of the system, not the whole system. And as a result, the system is less efficient today. If you look back all the way to 1950, which is the data is available, and take the graphs, and this is a graph that I did off of that data, you can see that um, this is the rejected energy in the U.S. This is the useful energy. We haven't really improved. Um, and since the 1980s, we haven't broke about the 43% mark efficient. So we've been wasting around 56, 57% of the energy for a very long time. It's a lot of money. And as Rob mentioned in his, uh, the quadrennial report also pointed this out, saying that nearly 60% of our primary energy is lost as waste heat, something we can use. So how does that compare globally? So I took the Lawrence Livermore uh, diagrams and picked out the G8 plus emerging and then added some other countries in. And you can see that uh, Norway is, is way up here at nearly 60%. Uh, of the energy is used. Brazil is well over 50%. China is right about 50-50. Got a whole grouping in here in the middle. And here's the US, dead last. One of the reasons why we have to have inexpensive energy is because we waste so much of it. It's a drain on our economy. In Minnesota, we use uh, uh, total energy uses about 1.8 trillion BTUs of energy, or 1.8 quadrillion, I'm sorry, 1,800 trillion BTUs of energy on an annual basis, about $21 billion a year is what that equates to. Now, in Minnesota, we have a lot of resources, 
energy is not one of them. We have a lot of wind and we have good solar, but we import all of our oil, we import all of our natural gas, we import all of our coal, we import um, materials for our nuclear reactors. And so $21 billion, a lot of flow out of our economy to neighboring states and into Canada. So if we can use energy more efficiently, it benefits our economy. We keep more dollars in our local economy. Well, how does Minnesota, you think a progressive state like Minnesota, we've certainly got to be more efficient. We're not. We really mirror the U.S. Uh, profile. About 57.7% is lost. Um, you can see our efficiency is right around 32% on power generation. Um, so we don't. We're about the same. Well, how much energy is that? So roughly 37% of our rejected energy, which is 1,000 trillion BTUs every year, is wasted as heat in a state that has some winters to it. Actually, the last snow just melted out of my yard last weekend. Um, so we have a lot of, uh, a lot of need for heat and we have a tremendous amount of wasted energy. If we think about where we're focusing our efforts on energy conservation as a country, we're fo focusing a lot of it on buildings. Let's make buildings more efficient. And we should. We should use, make energy well, used where it's used more efficient. And that certainly helps with the supply. And a lot of it's focused down in this area, but you can see we're not changing the outcome of the system. So with this in mind, we've been working on legislation, as Ted said in his remarks, focus on the waste. And we've been working on legislation in Minnesota, which is now ready to go to the floor uh, in both the House and the Senate on this session, that would uh, encourage the recovery and re reuse of waste heat. And so basically, it's fuel agnostic, don't care what it comes from, it's technology agnostic, it's basically if you recover the waste heat, and you use it to reduce electricity, if you use it to reduce natural gas, the utilities can count that against their goals. And in Minnesota, we have a program called SIP, Conservation Improvement Programs, where the utilities invest in reducing natural gas and electricity usage. And so those funds can then be used uh, to invest in those projects because they're using waste heat to reduce natural gas and electricity. Seems kind of simple. It's a gap in our legislation right now, so for example, if I improve the efficiency in this industrial building or this process uh, to the extent that I possibly can and I still have waste heat, there's really no incentive for that heat to be used across the street to another building that could use it. And this legislation would encourage the recovery and reuse of that heat either at that site or beyond that site and the utilities uh, then can invest in it. We think it's got a lot of promise. We've, had, we've gone through the committees and we've had zero no votes on this legislation, so we're feeling pretty good that it's going to get passed in this session. Um, thank you, Bian. Glad to answer any questions that you have on it. Thanks so much, Ken. And I must say, too, when you were talking about how needing that we need cheap energy because we waste so much, and it's the only way, therefore, we can keep it affordable, I was struck also with, with that statement and the discussion earlier with regard to looking at Copenhagen and Denmark overall. Because I know in terms of the Danish officials that I've met with over the course of the last 20 years, one of the things that they always said was that because energy was always expensive for them and that they were always dependent up on, uh, or for so many years, certainly in terms of fossil energy, dependent upon getting that from other places, that it meant that they had to become much more efficient. So it really has been a huge driver in their economy. So if anybody's also interested in pursuing that further, we have done a couple briefings and there was a briefing sort of telling the Danish story and how they've ended up with a really strong economy and at the same time driving their whole carbon profile, their use of energy way down. That is on EESI's website. So I think it's a very, very important uh, lesson for us all. So now, um, to round out our briefing, we are going to be turning to Mark Spur, who is 
not only the legislative director for uh, the International District Energy Association, IDEA, but Mark has been involved in terms of working with uh, communities and companies for years in terms of looking at the development of feasibility studies, uh, putting together analysis, planning in terms of so many projects both in the U.S. as well as overseas. Mark? Thank you, Carol. Uh, we, we've heard some, I think, very uh, convincing uh, discussion about why uh, district energy and combined heat and power are good things, but we're in Washington, so the question is, what can be done policy-wise uh, to help these things move along? And I think the, uh, you know, the, the, there's probably some ultimate answers in, in terms of long-term uh, uh, policy, but we're not close to comprehensive energy or climate policy in, in, in this country right now. So I think uh, for the time being, we need to make some steps in the right direction. And I'd like to, to tell you a little bit about a couple of, uh, uh, a, a couple of bills. Uh, one that's been introduced, uh, and that's the Master Limited Partnerships Parity Act. Uh, tell you a little bit about that. I think many of you are familiar with it. It was introduced uh, a couple weeks ago. And then I'll, I'll go into a, a bit of discussion about the bill that Senator Franken referred to. It's a bill in the making uh, that uh, the Senator will be introducing soon. The Master Limited Partnerships Parity Act is, I think, an elegant bill. And you don't hear that term very much applied to legislation. But it's elegant in the sense that it, it takes uh, an existing law that happens to confer uh, advantages to oil and gas uh, uh, businesses and say, why shouldn't this also apply to renewable energy and efficiency? And, and, I, I, and I, that's a darn good question, a very common sense thing. A, a master limited partnership is a, a, a business entity that's taxed like a partnership. And the power of that is that you avoid double taxation because you don't go through a corporate tax and then an individual tax. That makes the cost of capital lower because you're avoiding taxation and investors therefore don't require as high a return. This is also a very liquid uh, uh, type of, of, of ownership interest and that makes it very uh, attractive to investors. So the, the bill, uh, does, as I, as I said a moment ago, it says, hey, we're allowing uh, the fossil fuel industries to use this, let's allow renewable energy uh, uh, to use it as well. So the types of renewable resources that are described in sections 45 and 48 of the tax code, those being the production tax credits and the investment tax credits, uh, respectively, uh, are uh, uh, qualifying uh, as, as uh, uh, MP, uh, MLP investments, and uh, there are a number of other categories that are also uh, uh, included, and, uh, such as uh, renewable transportation fuels, uh, uh, waste heat to power, and other, uh, other technologies. We believe this is an enormously uh, useful and common sense bill. Uh, it will not only help uh, develop, for example, combined heat and power or waste heat recovery, but it also will cover the distribution of that energy, such as the pipe that, uh, that, that Bill was talking about earlier. Uh, we strongly urge uh, support for this bill. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, the Local Energy Supply and Resiliency Act. This is the bill in draft form right now. Uh, it also is addressing what is a crucial barrier to making these kinds of systems happen, and that's cost of capital. Bill made reference to the fact that, hey, that pipe was kind of expensive. And, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you that the wonderful things that uh, have been done at Princeton and in St. Paul were also fairly capital intensive, but uh, they allow us in the long term to reduce costs reduce environmental harm and reduce use of fossil fuels. So the Master Limited Partnerships Parity Act will help very much on the equity side of things. But there's a huge uh, opportunity in the many universities that are out there uh, uh, or, or colleges or hospital complexes or communities who would like to put in this kind of infrastructure who need access to low-cost capital. 
So that's the, that's the basic idea. Uh, the, the, uh, the fundamental core of the bill is a revolving loan uh, fund, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. And I think it's clear from the prior presentations what we're talking about. Why, why do we want to do this? We want to reduce fossil fuel use. We want to increase energy uh, resiliency and reliability. We want to increase uh, 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 the environment or benefit the environment by reducing emissions and keep energy dollars in the local community instead of sending it off to Montana or Saudi Arabia or, or wherever. Uh, we, you've seen various uh, 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 types of, of uh, graphs like this or, or pictures like this. This is my favorite just because it's kind of cute and cartoony, but it's the, the basic idea is there's a lot of energy right in our own backyards that we could tap to meet our needs. Uh, Senator Franken mentioned uh, Grand Marais, Minnesota. That's uh, a, a town in northern Minnesota that uh, is uh, developing a biomass district heating system. And I got involved in that uh, project about a year ago. And when I went to visit the Public Utilities Commission uh, about it, I said, well, you know, why are you interested in this? Thinking I'd hear, uh, gee, we want to get off the fossil fuel price roller coaster. Uh, we want to reduce greenhouse gases. Uh, we want to keep uh, energy dollars in our community. Uh, he said something that surprised me. He said, well, fire. Uh, forest products industry in northern Minnesota is, is, is way down uh, because of shifts in, uh, uh, in international markets for, for uh, forestry products. And there are a lot of uh, parts of the woods that are falling in on themselves. And are becoming, in the, in the terms of, of, of the foresters, this is a new term, I bet you've never heard this, decadent forests. And they're overaged, they're falling down, and they're becoming fire hazards. These, these folks have actually been burning uh, uh, some of this, this uh, uh, excess fuel in pits just to reduce fire hazard. So their, their idea was, why don't we use it for energy instead? There are lots of opportunities to do multiple, uh, multiple benefits. Uh, we've talked a lot about waste heat. Uh, this, is, this is a much simpler version of the, of the Lawrence Livermore uh, uh, chart that Ken showed. Uh, I've boiled it down, and, and let me just step away from the mic here for a second. So, so whereas, whereas Ken was looking at all of the ways, I, I kind of took out uh, transportation and said, well, there's energy going into transportation. Uh, a lot of it is waste, but I think in the near term it's going to be pretty hard to tap that. So I'm going to set that to the side. But when you, when you simply look at, uh, at the power sector and the residential, and commercial, and, and industrial sectors, 36% of our national energy is, is waste heat, mostly in power plants. 27% from power plants and the balance of waste heat from uh, buildings or industry. And, and so it's about half and half. Half of it's used, half of it's not. That's a, that's a huge opportunity. The, uh, the bill that Senator Franken is working on has three main parts. Uh, one part is to help uh, communities and, and universities and others uh, identify opportunities to use waste heat and renewable energy, evaluate those opportunities, uh, address barriers to the development of those systems, do the engineering, because it takes a certain amount of effort to tee these things up uh, for, for financing. Uh, this would be uh, open uh, at this point in the, in the uh, draft uh, legislation, would be open to both uh, public and private entities. The core of the bill is to establish a revolving fund, because we need a, a, a source of low-cost capital to, to implement these systems, and the idea would be that the fund would be established with appropriations, would, uh, would revolve so that loan repayments would go back into the fund for 10 years. And then the idea is, after 10 years, those loan repayments go back into the Treasury for deficit reduction. So long term, we, we, uh, we really repay the Treasury for the money used. But we need a, a, a low-cost source of funds, and the proposal is to make uh, the financing available at the interest rate of U.S. Treasury bonds of a comparable maturity. 
And then uh, we, we would also like to, uh, in the bill, reauthorize a program that was authorized in ESA in, in, in 2007 uh, that has now, the authorization's lapsed, but it would establish an inventory of waste heat in, in the United States so that we know where the BTUs are and uh, get an opportunity and facilitate uh, the ability to tap that energy uh, uh, to, to be useful instead of wasted. This is a very packed chart, but, but bear with me for just a second. What I wanted to illustrate was the impact of cost of capital on project viability. And I'm using the example of a biomass uh, district heating system uh, compared to natural gas. So this blue line here, this blue dash line, is the cost per million BTU of heat. So this is after boiler uh, efficiency based on uh, US EIA's average commercial natural gas cost. The, the green line is the cost per million BTU of biomass heat. It's a capital intensive affair, so it, it very much depends on what the average cost of capital is. Um, if, if you're gonna go to a private entity and say, hey, you know, if you wanna build this thing, they're gonna look at, you know, they're gonna and have some debt, some equity, and their related average cost of capital might be somewhere close to 10%. Uh, but you see, that makes biomass pretty expensive. If you go out and do it in an industrial uh, revenue bond, uh, you know, pretty wide range here because it depends a lot on the risk conditions in, in, in particular. And that helps bring the cost down, but it still doesn't get you where you want to go. If you go to GOs, uh, general obligation bonds that a, a, a local government might uh, implement, you, you start getting close to, uh, uh, to, to really making things go. Uh, but here's the range that we're talking about trying to target with treasuries, which will give you a comfortable margin to really give uh, projects a push. This is the fundamental concept of this thing, is that we need to have long-term, low-cost capital. And with that, I thank you. Um, I would just mention, too, that EESI has done a fact sheet with regard to MLPs, uh, Master Limited Partnerships. It's available on our website. This is bipartisan legislation. It's been introduced on both sides of the Hill. Um, and so let's open it up for your questions or comments in our remaining period. Okay. Could you identify yourself, please? Uh, good morning. Uh, congratulations on the work uh, with the office of Hi, good morning. I'm Brandon Mitchell with the Office of the Deputy Mayor here in Washington, and I've actually spoken with Rob and Mark. Um, one of the projects that I'm assigned to is the Walter Reed redevelopment, which will uh, in time become a three million square foot mixed use, mixed income project. All the utilities have to come out. Some of the utility infrastructure has been there since Teddy Roosevelt was in the White House. and. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is a CCHP system with a PV array. One of the biggest challenges we're facing is the degree to which we can get local utility cooperation on standby fees, interconnection fees, um, other technical support, the ownership of distribution. And so what I've learned from my colleagues around the country is that the CHP and the CCHP savings get whittled away when um, you interconnect to the local utilities. And so I'd like to know from the panel what your experiences have been and how folks you've worked with have been able to overcome those challenges. Probably a few people will want to comment. So just make sure your mics are on. Sure, I'll jump in. Uh, our experience is the same as yours. <laughs> the utilities will chew away uh, around the edges. Uh, you know, the three big challenges are backup rates, interconnection standards and franchise rules. And for those who aren't familiar with this battle, um, interconnection standards is when you try to attach to the grid with a generator. If the grid wasn't built to accept distributed generation, it costs a bundle to do it. So the utility will look where you connect to the grid and say, well, now there's grounding problems because of your generator, so I have to change the service to all the other buildings on that network feed. And it just, and, and they add that to your bill to connect. Uh, the, you know, the second issue is backup rates. So, in, in other words, you put in a 10 megawatt plant and, you, and it's going to have to come offline for maintenance. 
it periodically may trip offline. So you'll still stay connected to the grid for backup and the utility will come in. Some utilities charge nothing. Others will charge you 70% and other creative ways of charging you so that you really, even though you put in the 10 megawatt plant, you're still paying for it as if you didn't have it or some big chunk of it to the utility. Uh, and there's lots of reasons for this. I mean, it's the whole history of how the grid was built, how utilities are, are, make their money, uh, but it is a challenge. And then the final one is um, uh, uh, franchise rights. So uh, particularly in deregulated states where the utilities basically, when they had to sell off all the generation and they just became transmission and distribution, the grand bargain was, okay, we'll part with generation. Oh, by the way, we get to recover that through stranded asset deals but we get exclusive franchise rights in our territory. So we're the only ones who can run wires in the streets. That's it. So what happens as a developer, or you know, whether it's an institution or a third-party developer, you look at your campus and you say, I gotta build a CHP and I gotta optimize it so I can make it pencil. I have to pick up enough of the thermal load uh, to balance that with the electric load to make this thing work so that it's worth investing in. So there's a return. And what happens is you have to cross the street to pick up the other half of your campus or across two streets to pick up your campus. And you can't. Because as soon as you do, a, a, well, let me back up, a big part of your savings when you come off the grid is you don't have to pay for the utilities wires anymore. They're transmission and distribution because you're doing it yourself. You're making your electricity, you're distributing it around your site. But what happens is when you have to cross the street, usually the utility will say, okay, you gotta use our wires. So you can run your wires, but they become theirs, or they put them in for you, and you still have to pay the T&D. So it's a shame, because we can see the benefits are, it's duh. I mean, you look at it and say 50% versus 85%, but it's the same battle. Now, it's, we're winning in some places. You know, you have, we kind of pick our battles, and we see which utilities are being more progressive. Um, some are progressive, some are not, and some are in the middle paying lip service. Um, you know, for them it's a challenge because the best load is what? These energy dense fields, campuses, industrial sites, office towers. So for them, they look at it and say, wait a minute, how do I make money now? All I am is T and D. Uh, and you take the Swiss cheese bites out of their franchise and they, get right, they have stockholders like everybody else. So it, it really becomes a policy issue. Uh, otherwise, you, you can force the, try to force the utilities there, but you know, They've been fighting this battle for a long time and they're pretty good at it, and for obvious reasons. So it needs to be a policy initiative where they're held harmless and there's, you fly up to 100,000 feet rather than a 10,000 foot view and look at you know, how the grid is serving the, the uh, society um, on an economic and an environmental benefit level. So long-winded answer to having the same fight as you, but um, it, the barriers are coming down and in, in, in some states are leading the way on it. Um, Final comment, it's not just at a state level, it's at the PUC levels, public utility commissions. So it's not just legislation, it's ultimately legislation, but then it's how does the PUC interpret it. So it's, it's an interesting battle. More and more opportunities to get things done, right? Yeah. Um, is, did you have a quick comment? And then, because sure. I think probably this deserves a much longer conversation with people afterwards. Yeah, just a, a real quick comment in New Jersey at Princeton. Uh, you know, we suffer the same kind of issues, but there's one very nice piece of legislation that went through that really helps us out, and that is um, in New Jersey, if you have a thermal distribution system and you're generating power, so my co-generation plant, I'm actually allowed to wheel around the block and back into my other substation because uh, I'm serving my thermal customers with electricity. So there's some legislation that actually helps us out a great deal. Does, does that make sense in, in what we're talking about? And New Jersey's leading the charge on that, as far as yeah. that type of legislation. Yeah. So there is there is example there are examples out there that are really quite helpful to us. And, and just the final point, Brandon. Welcome to the club. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're happy to have you. Uh, you're not alone. You know this is the age old uh, challenge. Uh, the, if there were a, a symbol for District Energy CHP, it would be Sisyphus. <laughs> Everyone familiar with the Greek god? Push the boulder up the hill. We have gotten some boulders over, and we'd be happy to help you. I think the DOE Clean Energy Application Centers can, can weigh in. Uh, there are some resources, precedent, policy initiatives, et cetera. Um, but I think it, it does take a village and an industry, and uh, you know, we really would be happy to help you uh, identify, but also maybe you know, find some solutions. Great, because that's a wonderful site. So, um, other, okay, right here first. Uh, 
Uh, yes, this is, I'm Bill Dickinson, a private consultant. Uh, this has been fascinating, but uh, the issue I think this gentleman hit upon uh, and that I'm curious about is when we talk about district energies or energy districts, are these governmental? Are they uh, not-for-profit? Are they special authorities? Or, uh, or is there a combination? What's all, all of the above. And how are they governed? And what authorities do they have? Do they I'll, I'll start and then, uh, so they range from uh, privately owned and you know, investor owned subsidiaries of utilities. Uh, they're governed often by a franchise you know, within the community they serve. So under the jurisdiction of the, you know, the local city municipality laws, uh, they adhere to all the you know, codes and requirements of the region. They comply with all state and federal air emissions, et cetera. So they're very much you know, a, a regulated operating entity. Uh, district heating systems that are legacy that go back to when the uh, investor utility was selling heat as well as power. You know, those steam systems oper often operate under tariff and uh, often are regulated by the Public Utility Commission in their state. So uh, they're subject to review and rate case, etc. cetera. Uh, but a lot of the district cooling systems in the U.S. that have been built are not regulated. They frankly compete. Uh, you know, if you're a building owner, you can choose to connect to this network of chilled water or you can put in your own chillers. And often it's a long-term uh, arrangement, a contract, very transparent, very well um, uh, ab you know, uh, 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 managed by informed entities. And so it's really a contractual arrangement, often 20, 25 years. But the, the ownership ranges from private to public to hybrid to institution uh, and uh, re all of the above. So it's, a, it's really quite a range. Anyone care to add, Ken? In St. Paul, we have uh, 501c3 nonprofits, um, and we're regulated by the city, and we have a franchise. So, as Rob said, it really is, it's a spectrum, and it really depends on, on the companies, the local market, in some cases, state law. Of, of, our, of our 17 networks in the U.S., two are regulated from a uh, tariff perspective, cost perspective. The rest are just free market. You have to compete. And so we have to be competitive on a delivered energy basis. We have to offer value. Um, we don't really have a tailwind of regulatory support. You know, we really lack a lot of incentives that support the growth of some of our sister industries. Um, and so, um, you know, I think ultimately we've survived and thrived because we're economically competitive and provide value to our customers. Princeton's is just an asset that the university owns. We bought it, we built it, because we think it's the best and most cost-effective way of doing our business. Okay. Um, did, okay, here first, and then we'll come to the back. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Mark or the entire panel. This is Hannah Northey from Greenwire. Um, has Senator Frank, and I saw that he introduced legislation in the past to incentivize combined heat and power, has that, can you, can you give us a little legislative history, what's happened to those measures, and is this bill that he's gonna introduce facing any challenges? Is there, a, is there an appetite for this on Capitol Hill? Good, good questions. Uh, uh, several years ago, uh, the senator introduced a bill that would have done a number of things, including expand the availability of production tax credits uh, for certain types of renewable thermal energy. Uh, that uh, bill uh, was, was introduced on a bipartisan basis in the, in the Senate, also had a House companion uh, in, in the, uh, the shuffle of a lot of other issues that did not advance. Uh, when we discussed uh, more recently uh, 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 another legislative effort to, to help in this area, uh, we told the Senator that we thought that the uh, that, that tax credits were, uh, first of all, not uh, useful uh, to, to a broad array of sectors because you're leaving out non-taxpaying entities. And uh, experience seems to indicate that not even, even among private sector taxpaying entities, uh, there's a limited amount of tax appetite that a, a lot of companies can't actually make use of uh, tax credits because of the tax situation. So that's what brought us to this idea of a revolving fund, which is going to uh, 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 lift a, r a range of boats uh, in, in, I think, a, a, a much more useful way. 
uh, we're uh, we're having discussions uh, regarding the the you know, support on the hill. Uh, it, it hasn't been introduced yet. It's coming soon. Uh, we're having some initial discussions. Uh, we we like to see it uh, introduced with uh, a Republican co-sponsor. So we're working uh, we're working on that. Does that help? And and I would just I would just add. Um, so in addition to you know. I think beyond Capitol Hill, we're finding the voice of mayors and sustainability directors in cities that really want more reliable, resilient infrastructure. They see this as a, you know, an effective vehicle to get there. Um, our institutions that have you know, heating only systems really want to deploy combined heat and power, so they want to see a vehicle that can enable that. And we work very closely with the Department of Energy in the Clean Energy Application Centers, as well as the EPA, the CHP partnership. So those two agencies have really been, uh, you know, very engaged in trying to deploy and, and increase the market share for CHP and district energy. So uh, I think we do need to do a better job on the Hill and, and uh, it kind of sparking awareness among staff like you, uh, what this could do. Um, but out there, you know, people are looking for this and want mechanisms to, to get there. And the industry is growing, but, uh, you know, this would, I think, uh, accelerate our penetration at a time where it's really quite needed. And I think just to further, you know, the, the point on cities, um, so cities are coming around to this, so any eco zones or new development areas in cities, when you talk smart cities, typically at the core of one of those, there's going to be a CCHP plant, uh, at least uh, uh, at the beginning of the design process. Um, and the, so the cities are, are getting it. Uh, the real estate community is starting to get it as well. Why? Because people are willing to pay for it, one. So people want to know that the energy usage of the building they're going to rent or live in or build their stuff in. Uh, and cities, again, like you know, Mayor Bloomberg, um, uh, so New York's doing it, Philly's doing it, other cities are going to fall soon, is every building's going to have a label. You're going to have a mile per gallon, if you will, on a building. It's going to tell you what the energy usage is. That's getting the attention of the real estate industry. You know, if you've got a dog of a building, good luck trying to fill it. Your occupancy rates are going to change. And part of the solution for that is going to be uh, if you can get credit. In other words, if you're on a district that's powered by CHP and we can rationalize the fact that your footprint is different because of it, your label gets better. So I think, again, it's making sure that it's understood as these new mechanisms come, come into play in these cities that are trying to lead the charge to make sure we get credit for the fact that we are an efficient solution as well. And then just a, a final point, if I could add, you know, we're really, we're trying to also reorient the thinking, the yin and yang on this is that, you know, if you look at the charts we just exposed you all to, you know, we're wasting all of this energy. I mean, we're literally throwing it away and we don't have to do that. This is not, you know, the next, this is not, you know, where we are is my grandfather's grid and what we're offering is your children's future. And it's very simple to put pipe in the ground and make these systems work. But we need your help. We need you to talk to your members and make them aware that, man, we have a solution and it works, and uh, here's what it's called. District energy, combined heat and power, and microgrids. So, you know, we're here hoping to proselytize and get you to join our army and uh, help us help, you know, Brandon. Uh, because we think it makes common sense. Sometimes an entity not often traded in Capitol Hill. You, you know, and historically, it's the sad thing is, is we invented it here. The first big district energy systems in the world were all in the U.S. Right. So the oldest systems on the planet are in our big urban cores. Yet we kind of forgot about it, where other countries now have taken it and run with it. Uh, I mean, we're building many districts and CCHPs in China. Okay, they get it. All their cities are going to be fed from these. So we, we need to kind of remember what we learned a long time ago. Back to the future in every yeah. sense. And one last point. The Capital Power Plant that supplies, as I mentioned earlier, all the heating and cooling, all the buildings in the Capitol, is, in fact, in investing in combined heat and power, is installing cogeneration. I think it's right, 15 megawatts. You'll be hearing more about that. Uh, so, you know, we're making some progress. We think there's much more opportunity. Uh, but, you know, we, we have a lot to be proud of, really a lot more uh, ground to gain. I think you had another question over here. We, we have a Sorry. few questions. That's okay. Uh, there were a couple questions back here. Okay. So let's go there first, and then we'll come over to you. Uh, uh, Deborah Jacobson, GW Law School. Well, um, some innovative financing approaches have taken hold at the state level 
including uh, PACE, Property Assessed Clean Energy, as well as on-bill financing. And in, uh, in the interim, before any new legislation passes, I'm wondering if these offer some opportunities to overcome these high upfront capital costs. Well, what we're seeing is uh, take a class of institutions like hospitals. Okay, hospitals, they all want to add a, a CHP plant, frankly, to their district. Uh, and when you do the economics uh, perversely, cheap gas isn't helping. Because remember, this is an efficiency play. So you're more efficient than the grid. So you're going to be, if you're 20 points more efficient, you have to multiply that by the cost of the fuel to find out how many dollars you save. So cheaper gas has made the payback periods longer. So that is a bit of a challenge. So these projects that are a bit on the bubble now because of cost, then you look at financing. What can that do for you? But then there's still the barrier issue and the uncertainty of can you get the project to go the way you penciled it? And w when you're facing the barriers from the utilities, um, it's, it's, it's questionable many times, even if you can get the cheap cost of capital, which should help, but the barriers still have some people on the fence. So again, the further we can get it down, the more likely it will be to tip the, see you know, the, the seesaw and the projects go forward. Uh, but the, the barrier issues still need to be solved as well. I, I just want to try to answer your question uh, directly. I think uh, that, you know, that the PACE type approach is, is a terrific approach. I think it would be hard to fit it into these kinds of uh, situations because with PACE, you, 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 you're, you're, you're taking advantage of an ongoing uh, utility uh, uh, billing uh, uh, arrangement. Uh, it, there's, there's not a really good analog uh, to apply it to these kinds of systems. So I, I think as a mechanism, uh, it would be hard to adapt that concept uh, uh, to this. But I'm open, to, I'm open to bright ideas there, but that's my, that's my initial reaction. OK. Uh, just one, one other. So in, the, in its current form, PACE you know, was really like a utility-centered you know, mechanism to fund efficiency or renewable improvements. Um, so the vehicle is really the local utility. Now, it could be in, an, in the next iteration, you know, you could have sort of a, you know, a pace mechanism to fund, you know, a new district energy investment, a, you, know, a, a, you know, sort of a, a mechanism. But I think the capital scale, the, the uh, penetration rate, you know, sort of the coverage issues, it, it probably isn't, as Mark said, you know, sort of the, the, the most effective vehicle to germinate a, you know, a big capital intensive uh, project at the outset. Many of these projects take a mosaic of solutions to put together. You know, many, many things come to the table and so it might be a part of it, um, but it's not going to be the magic bullet. Okay, we had a couple other questions, one back here, okay. Hi there, I'm Annie Downs with ACEEE. Um, we've talked a lot about state and federal policy options. I just had I um, wanted you to expand a bit on municipal governments and if there are any um, best practices for policies that they can implement to encourage district energy with CHP. Yeah. I, I, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. Uh, we, we've, we've done a lot of work uh, along these lines and I think there are a range of things that, that local governments can do. One very important fundamental thing is that uh, local governments should do everything within their power and political parameters to uh, encourage or require new building development uh, to, to have what we call hydronic uh, heating and cooling systems. In other words, uh, they're, they're actually making hot water and chilled water within the, the building and circulating it space within the building in order to provide heating and cooling. A hydronic system uh, is easily convertible to uh, district energy. Uh, other types of systems where, for example, you're just running electrical wire to, uh, to the building space and they're using electric resistance heating in the space for heating, that's not convertible to district energy. So that's a very, very fundamental uh, thing. I also think that, that local governments can uh, uh, in, in encourage uh, uh, developers to think about district energy uh, if they actually have a, a kind of a, a framework or a vision uh, for district energy and have done some of the groundwork that we're hoping the Franken Bill's technical assistance uh, program uh, can help with. 
so that they've done the groundwork to say, well, gee, we've got this area, this redevelopment area. Uh, this looks like a, a good low density, is what we worry about as engineers. Uh, and, and so we're kind of keeping an eye on this area as a potential opportunity for, for district energy. I think doing some of that mm -hmm. uh, uh, community energy planning where they, they might, for example, also look at, uh, well, are there local power plants who are kicking off uh, uh, waste heat? Or is there, is, there a, is there a server farm out here? Which, you know, <laughs> the ironic thing about, about air conditioning is that, what are you doing? You're getting rid of heat. And as has been discussed, usually that just goes into the air or into water. So, and, and of course, server farms are, are, are huge heat generators. So there are a lot of opportunities. I think that kind of planning can be very helpful. The other thing I would encourage is that, uh, and you're seeing that as the uh, municipalities can uh, re require or certainly encourage doing a life cycle cost analysis rather than a first cost. Yeah. And then you're getting the total cost in, involved in that analysis, and that certainly helps towards um, having a fair evaluation of the benefits that you get from district energy. Yeah, there's some fundamentals, in, in particularly in new development. You know, um, real estate group is looking at first cost. That's right. traditionally how they've looked at it. And then they approach the community that's going to help them build the building, the AE community. They want to build plants. They don't just want to connect to a district. Right. So the permitting organizations, once they force the look, they don't have to try to legislate what the solution is, but force uh, the look at the alternatives, the look at district energy, the look at C, uh, combined heat and power, and then let it compete on its own two yep. feet. And uh, in many cases, we win once we get the look. Okay. Yeah, I want to echo that this is exactly the approach that Princeton takes. We look at the life cycle cost of all of these energy opportunities. The one thing that I'd add is push towards designs that use the lowest grade energy possible. That is, if you can use uh, warm water as opposed to very hot water, if you can use hot water as opposed to steam, you're enabling a lot of different technologies by doing that. So if we put uh, heating or cooling coils in the, in the floor slab of this room, we might be able to use solar hot water, we might be able to use ground source heat pumps, and we could easily connect to district energy. So it allows much more flexibility than if you design with very high uh, thermal energy demands or extreme temperatures. Uh, so that's one of the things that we're, we're working towards, and that allows much more flexibility for the building many years down the road. So that's what I would suggest the municipality should do, just as our little uh, community is doing at the university. And a, and a final point, um, last year IDA released the Community Energy Development Guide. It's really the book on how to think about energy mapping your community and evaluate district energy, combined heat and power. So that's available for free on our website, Community Energy Development Guide. And you can make that, you know, if you have municipalities that are curious, this is really the, sort of the non-technical guide to, you know, getting there. And then secondly, working with the D DOE Clean Energy Application Centers, we've developed a, uh, a screening tool that can, uh, you know, help them do an, a quick economic analysis, sort of a red, yellow, green. You know, red, it just doesn't make economic sense. Yellow, you, you know, it, it has some potential, might need some tweaking. But green, there really is a ter terrific opportunity here, and it bears, you know, further investment. Um, so we've created some tools that we think are, would be useful uh, for communities uh, to, to, you know, advance their energy mapping and their strategy. Great. Well, we're out of time. Uh, I know that there are a couple questions, but hopefully you can go ahead and ask our panel. Um, I did want to mention we will also provide a link on our website to the Community Energy Development Guide. Uh, the presentations and video will be up on EESI's website. Uh, and because this issue is so important in terms of, as you have heard, there's so many opportunities. We were planning to do kind of a little mini series and hope to do a lot more in this. And so stay tuned. On May 22nd, we'll be taking another um, uh, look at the whole role of CHP and what it can mean in terms of our economy. So that will be the afternoon of May 22nd. So hope we will see you here. And there's. Lots of... Um, so we don't want to see any waste food. That's right. So it's part please. of the whole waste. This is with all heat gen so, generated. So please grab some orange juice and grab some danishes. And thank you all for coming. And thank you very much for wonderful, wonderful... That was brilliant. Work.